Hi. Uh, so I'm going to give the science talk of the day. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a change of pace from the other, uh, uh, the other talks. Um, so I'm a research scientist at Argonne National Lab. Uh, we do science, which sounds like it's probably a little bit different uh, from what the other speakers have been talking about. But it turns out it's actually very similar in a lot of ways. Um, so Argonne National Laboratory, for people who aren't familiar with it, is a Department of Energy-funded basic research lab. It's about 25 miles southwest of here. Uh, basically, we're a, a multi-program uh, multi lab that has uh, research in everything from high-energy physics, um, you know, the nuclear program, climate, uh, biology, uh, an experiment, uh, a large computational science program. We have a supercomputer center. Uh, basically, scientific productivity is, is, in some sense, our business goal. So uh, the way that we compete in the research landscape is to build better facilities and to do better science than our competitors do. So over the last, uh, I've been at the lab 14 years, and over that time, computing has gone from something that a few scientists do to something that most of our scientists are engaged with in some way, in a, in a much deeper way. Uh, computing really has become an important part of, of most disciplines of science at this point. So uh, in that capacity, we have about a million cores on the floor in production today. So we have a supercomputer center, two machines in production, a variety of other smaller systems. And, you know, overall, the right way to think about DOE in the National Labs is that we run large-scale user facilities. So these are basically scientific instruments that are used to tackle hard problems, and time is granted on them to uh, academics and industry, um, basically to solve open scientific problems. So at Argonne, we have six major facilities. Uh, the one that I'm the most concerned with is the supercomputer center, uh, being a computing person. Uh, but, uh, but there is also the advanced photon source and a variety of other uh, uh, facilities. So in the context of, of, this, uh, uh, of these large-scale computing systems, we got a research grant in 2009 to explore cloud computing for high-end, or higher, uh, sorry, uh, for mid-range HPC workloads. So this is not what you use the supercomputers for, but the sort of daily business of science, right? So uh, on our supercomputers, these are systems with hundreds of thousands of cores. Uh, they're often used to run a single application at one time, and so these are very rare kinds of hero runs. And what we were tackling with Magellan was a much more um, uh, pedestrian daily computing use case as opposed to these sort of hero runs on the big machines. And so our, our primary question was, when are clouds useful for technical computing workloads, right? So in 2009, it, clouds were getting to be kind of a hot topic, but at that point, I don't think it was very clear to a lot of people what clouds were exactly or what they were for, uh, whereas now everybody's decided that cloud means everything to everybody, and so all you need to do is sprinkle cloud in your product, and some people will buy it. Um, and so, so we were really going at this from a, a, a sort of open-ended perspective to try to figure out what clouds were good for and what we could do with them that we couldn't do with our, our traditional computing resources. So the way that we conducted this project is we built a machine like we were building an HPC cluster, but we ran it like a cloud. And we tried to get the system software to work and tried to get users working and so forth. Um, primarily, our bioinformatics users ended up uh, using the machine. And... Uh, uh, and they've ended up pretty happy over, overall. We ended up deploying the machine into production. Um, so we started off in, in 2009 running Eucalyptus. Um, this didn't work well. You can find other slides from other talks I've given with more details on that. Um, I, in one case, used a picture of my crying year-old daughter to explain the emotional reaction that we had after running it for a while. Um, after this Eucalyptus experience, we deployed OpenStack and have had good, good luck with that. So we've been running OpenStack at scale for about three years at this point. Um, and uh, the Magellan system that we've got at Argonne was actually the largest OpenStack system deployed in the world for about 18 months. Uh, thankfully, this is no longer the case. It turns out you never actually want to be the biggest system of anything around. It's, it's more trouble than it's worth. Um, and so when we built this system, we built it for high performance. And so we were really building to a different sort of design spec than most people typically build clouds to. Uh, for example, we, uh, uh, two, two examples of this are that we, we used InfiniBand for high performance I.O., uh, our success with InfiniBand has been sort of mixed, but overall it's, I think, been a win for us. It's, it's a pretty high-performance network. It's a 40 gigabit, nearly non-blocking network. Um, we've also deployed nodes with a terabyte of memory that users can check out. Um, and, and over the course of the project, we've uh, performed a variety of different performance experiments and expeditions. Uh, one thing that we, we did sort of earlier uh, is we are connected to the Department of Energy's uh, high-speed research network. It's a cross-country 100 gigabit 
fabric, and uh, we managed to saturate it using 10 virtual machines off of Magellan. Um, I, uh, I gave some technical details in the boot camp yesterday, and uh, Scott DeVoid from my team is going to be talking later, and I think he might talk about this a little bit uh, in the OpenStack session this afternoon. Um, we've also integrated, a, or we're in the process of integrating a Gluster file system that's capable of doing 60 gigabytes a second. And we're trying to make all of this performance available inside of virtual machines in as transparent a, 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 a mode as possible to users. So the, the first question is, why OpenStack? So I, I think at a, at a basic level, because it worked, right? We'd had a lot of experiences. Anybody that's built systems knows that systems never work out of the box at, at any moderate scale, and you always need to do some work. And so we sort of went into this process expecting to need to do a bunch of work. Um, when we ran Eucalyptus, we found that we couldn't actually fix the problems with the system. Whereas when we ran into roadblocks with, with OpenStack, uh, we, we had good, good luck in, uh, in, in fixing those issues pretty quickly. Uh, overall, the project has a clean architecture. Uh, the code's pretty high quality. Uh, the, the level of excitement and the ecosystem surrounding OpenStack are really unlike uh, any other project that I've seen, save many, maybe the Linux kernel about 10 years ago. There's, there's just a lot of people that are, are engaged and excited in, in a very different way than you see with most open source projects. Um, we experienced pretty good scalability off the bat. We got our system up to 400 nodes without really having to do much work. And the most important thing from our perspective, since we were building something weird, is that OpenStack is flexible, and that really allowed us to build the system that we needed, as opposed to the, the turnkey system that was sort of what the vendor suggested you run. Um, the other thing that I like as a person who, who likes to build systems that work is that OpenStack primarily was built from a very pragmatic place. It was built by people that had a system that they needed to make work. And that means that you didn't necessarily get loads and loads of features from day one, but everything that was added was added from this, this uh, uh, position of needing to end up with a working system at the end of the day or hopefully at the end of the commit. And so this really meant that uh, the, 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 excuse me, the design systems that the authors made really uh, led the system in a very pragmatic direction, particularly off the bat. And so three years in, we've been, uh, uh, we've been pretty happy with this choice. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, this is not you know, magic pixie dust that you sprinkle on your machine and it works magically. Uh, there are absolutely pitfalls, but um, we, we've had pretty good luck with it. I mean, the, the, the one thing that's, that's really difficult about OpenStack is that um, it's extremely flexible and so this is a, a double-edged sword, right? So you need to decide what kind of system that you're building. Uh, but once you decide what kind of system you're building, generally speaking, OpenStack can accommodate you. So the thing from my perspective that's been the most interesting about this is that uh, we've, I, I won't go as far as saying that we did an experiment on our users because we don't have an IRB and people get very upset when you do that. But it was interesting watching how our users reacted to this system. So our users are typically used to having access to a fair amount of computing resources. Uh, we're a pretty computing resource rich sort of organization. Um, but uh, in this case, this was really sort of a different model of operating than they were used to. So uh, for starters, most of our users are computational scientists. And so they, uh, they really don't have any kind of operations background. Uh, they have logged into to, to Linux machines, but they probably haven't acted as an administrator before. Um, and we really needed to start at the beginning and starting with the basics of how Unix systems work and what they're trying to accomplish. And in some cases, we were able to get them to the point of, of administrative best practice. This is, this is sort of the best case scenario. I think that the, the most uh, delicate way I can put it was that uh, mistakes were absolutely made along this line. We had users that lost data. We, we had users that, uh, that made bad decisions and ended up paying for them in one way or another. But at the end of the day, they ended up lear learning a lot from these experiences. And we ended up learning from the experiences. I mean, this is, this is sort of one of those, those situations where you don't know how to expect the unexpected, right? Uh, this is something I'm learning as a father of a two-year-old. And it's not that dissimilar when you think about um, users that just aren't familiar with operations. They, they have a mental model of the system that's not necessarily very detailed or accurate yet. And, and so you need to figure out how to, how to move them through this process in as painless a way as possible. And so uh, 
the, the, the key thing here is that, that empowerment of the users means risk because you're giving your users the ability to do a lot more. And if you give them the ability to do a lot more, they will do a lot more, and this may or may not work out well for them I in the short-term basis, right? Um, at the end of the day, we really ended up with much, much savvier users. So the expertise level of our users and our developers at this point is way better than it was at the start of the project. And, uh, and the thing that's actually the most gratifying is that people have started prototyping much more complicated problems without talking to anyone. So they just sort of go away for a day or two and build custom infrastructure to, to, to work on a problem. And after they've done this three or four times and they've figured out the method that works, at that point they tell you about it. Whereas before, the first thing they would do is that go and bug the sysadmin to ask for some new infrastructure, or ask for, for some new storage or, or whatever. Now the system is self-service in a way that really uh, removes a lot of the friction from the, the prototyping and, and R&D process. So we learned a lot in terms of how we design systems from this process uh, as well. Uh, one thing that I didn't expect, uh, because we have been building these high efficiency batch computing environments for such a long time, uh, is that we figured out after a while that pathfinding is a critical workload for us. This sounds sort of silly when you say it out loud, but for an R&D organization, you need to figure out how to do new things, and you need to make it as easy as possible to figure out how to do new things. And so um, in that context, disintermediation and self-service end up being really, really important. And as a, an HPC person, uh, one of the primary things that, that we tend to value is computational efficiency. And so our large-scale machines are like finely tuned sports cars. But for R&D activities, it's sort of like driving a sports car to the grocery store every day, right? It's, it's, it's going to work really well until you try to get the groceries into the trunk. Um, and so we found that, that clouds really provide a, a, an important complementary role for our high-throughput, large-scale, highly efficient systems. Uh, in this context, multi-tenancy is a huge, huge win, um, in part because it enables all of this self-service stuff, uh, but also because it, it deals with, um, or it, it helps us to deal with the fact that, that users don't always know exactly how many resources they're going to consume. Virtualization is still a mixed blessing. This is something that vendors are working on, but it's, uh, it's still absolutely a work in progress, particularly as it pertains to specialized hardware as we often use in HPC. Uh, the drivers are still lagging, and, and this is an area that could really use improvement. That said, you can actually do pretty decently uh, with software offload approaches. The last thing that we realized that, that was really interesting is that our scientific efforts are increasingly building services, not just an application that runs. And so our projects accumulate data. That data needs to be made available to others in the community. Uh, we're building these scientific ensembles where we have some persistent infrastructure, some high-throughput compute component, and some real-time uh, service infrastructure with APIs that users can integrate with. And these are looking more like uh, traditional web applications with uh, high-efficiency compute bolted on the side. And so we're still working on what the right full system architecture is for that. So the important comment here is, is that we found that clouds really change your cost model. And when you change the cost model, it means that new things are actually are, are affordable and efficient that weren't previously uh, uh, reasonable to consider. And in our case, the thing that was critical is we actually needed to experiment. We needed to try all of this stuff out and see where our developers actually got their productivity wins from. We, uh, uh, there's no way that starting the project we could have predicted um, where our wins would have been without actually putting the system in front of users and really seeing what they did with it, right? This is really the big power of self-service. Um, so also, in hindsight, OpenStack was a really good choice for us. Uh, it was the right kind of system at the right time, and we really managed to build uh, the system that we wanted out of it. Um, and, it, and, and we've been on this process of uh, refining the system every six to nine months over the course of the last couple of years, and we're still iterating. Uh, but OpenStack really gives us the flexibility and the increasing feature set to, to be able to do that in an efficient fashion. Um, and, and overall, uh, I think that while there were a lot of people in the HPC community that were pretty skeptical of using cloud resources for anything, because of course virtualization is going to be slower than bare metal, um, we've demonstrated that there are a lot of uh, factors that are orthogonal to performance that end up mattering a lot for scientific progress, which at the end of the day is why we're providing this compute. And so um, 
you know, I, I think that this model is, is really the, the, right, uh, the mi right model going forward. And in the long term, uh, I think that we'll actually see some sort of convergence with uh, HPC systems and clouds, probably not for, for five to seven years, because the underlying technology problems are still pretty difficult. But uh, uh, I, I think that this is, uh, this, we're really going in the right direction here. And, um, as anybody who was in the OpenStack boot camp yesterday knows, I'm not by my nature an optimistic person, but I'm actually optimistic about, you know, this broad architecture going forward. Um, so that's uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, thanks.